Um, thank you to everyone for attending the industry leader lecture series, both in person and via Zoom. Uh, please take a moment to ensure your full name first and last is shown in your Zoom window. This will help us with attendance and sending out future communications. As a reminder, this session will be recorded. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation and you can direct those to the Q&A chat box below. For all student attendees, if you attend two of the three sessions this semester, you're eligible for a certificate of completion signed off by the Dean of the College Eng of Engineering and Computing Sciences upon request at the end of the last lecture of the semester. All attendees are automatically entered into a raffle for NYIT swag items, and the winner will be notified via email. You must change your name in your Zoom window to your full name to be eligible for the raffle. Now I'd like to introduce the Dean of the College of Engineering and Computing Sciences, Dr. Bob Akbaheshti, who unfortunately cannot be here in person today, but we do have a video. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the first session of the Fall 22 series of the Industry Leaders Talk Series hosted by the New York Institute of Technology's College of Engineering and Computing Sciences. My name is Bob Akbaheshti, Dean of the College. This series is co-hosted by our college, as well as the IEEE Region 1. Our audience today is composed of IEEE um, professional members, as well as student members from across the Northeastern United States, in addition to the College of Engineering's current students, alumni, faculty, and staff, and a number of distinguished guests. I would like to thank the College of Engineering's Dean's Executive Advisory Board, particularly its chair, Dr. Robert DeFazio, who has been instrumental in organizing this series. Today's industry leader presentation is titled Industry Leaders Lecture Series, the Tesla Science Center, launch of a global museum and science center. The speaker is Mr. Mark Alessi, an attorney and startup entrepreneur. He brings to his role uh, at the Tesla Science Center years of experience in the not-for-profit sector serving as the Executive Director of Business Incubator Association of New York State, as a board member of Peconic Bay Medical Center and Northwell Health, a former board member of the East End um, Arts Council, NASA Suffolk uh, Law Services, and the Long Island Power Authority. Please review a Mark's bio sketch available on the event website. Without any further ado, I will pass it on to Mr. Alessi. Well, I want to thank the Dean uh, for having me as a speaker and, and Mitch Maiman, who I know is on video right now, one of our board members at Tesla Science Center, for helping to arrange today's talk, and Sarah and Jill for all the behind the scenes, and for some of my friends in the audience, which I'll address a, a little bit later for attending. So my name is Mark Alessi. Uh, I am the Executive Director of the Tesla Science Center. Uh, I am not by trade a museum director. Uh, I am a serial entrepreneur and uh, I've spent some time in politics. But um, when I was serving in the New York State Assembly, my community came to me and said, we need to save Nikola Tesla's lab. Uh, this was in 2007, 2008. And now I'm starting to get embarrassed saying this, but I wasn't embarrassed in the past saying this. I didn't know who Nikola Tesla was. And I think a lot of folks here in the United States did not, he was not in the common lexicon uh, as he is in Europe and other parts of the world. And there's plenty of reasons for that. But my community educated me. And when I realized all of the technologies that Tesla touched that affect our lives today, and that his last standing lab is here on Long Island, I became an evangelist. And uh, as somebody that's very interested in technology and commercialization, I felt that this was a world historic site and I wanted to get involved. I did not realize I'd become executive director, but I became heavily involved uh, helping them get some state grant funding. A little bit about Tesla before I go into how this project actually launched, but that's, that's how I got involved. So Nikola Tesla, for those who are like me and did not realize all the things he's touched, over 300 patents, early forms of wireless. He's really well known for the induction motor, which is now in the Tesla car. That's why they named the company Tesla Motors. Uh, it's a modern day form of his induction motor that's in the car. Alternating current electricity, that's bringing the power to this room and, and, and to the campus and to our lives. That was primarily Nikola Tesla's work. And I'll get into that history in a little bit. Uh, fluorescent lighting, 
which this might be LEDs, but it looks like it could have been fluorescent back in the day, but fluorescent lighting, neon lighting, radio, which I'll get into that history a little bit. Tesla is the true inventor of radio. And we have a lot of innovators from around the world involved with the project. Many of them are involved with the Marconi Society. So we get into a little bit of uh, arguments over that. And I, I try to be diplomatic. Marconi was an amazing inventor in his own right. Um, tachometer, speedometer in your car. I don't have it on here because I haven't personally researched it, but I was told uh, the, the spark plug as well. Uh, but just remote control, there are so many technologies that Nikola Tesla has touched. And understand, when he was doing this seminal work in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, people thought it was wizardry. Uh, when he said, I'm going to invent you know, wireless or, or remote control, and he actually tested a, the first remote control boat here on Long Island. He called it the Teleautomaton. Uh, he did it at Shoreham, what is now Shoreham Beach, uh, which is uh, the community I live in now. I know some of the neighbors who are the descendants of the children that saw him on the bluff testing out this boat. And they ran up to this man in a you know, tall, skinny man in a suit that people, some of them knew, some of them didn't know him, but the children didn't know him. Mister, what are you doing? And he pointed out to the water and he's like, you see that boat out there? I'm controlling it from this box. And he hands the box to the little boy, Bob Oliver was his name. First kid to play with a remote control boat or remote control anything right here on Long Island. Uh, he, he showcased that uh, teleautomaton remote control boat at the uh, Madison Square Garden at an expo. And he was accused of having a trained monkey inside. And I think that's important because you have to understand in his time for to say I'm controlling something from hundreds of feet away, it was not fathomable. It's like me saying, I'm going to duck behind that door over there and teleport to Mars. And you're going to say that man's a lunatic. But that's the kind of game-changing technology he was working on. But how did he end up here? And this, this is an important story. So you probably have seen the movies that came out in the past couple of years, The Current Wars. Um, and you've heard of the AC-DC war and Tesla versus Edison, Westinghouse versus Edison. Nikola Tesla was recruited to work under Thomas Edison here in New York. He was working for the uh, Edison Corp in Paris, and he was working on electricity, but it was direct current electricity. And the managers at that operation realized that this is a, one of those once in a lifetime kinds of geniuses. And electricity was a novelty. It wasn't commercialized. Most folks were you know, reading by candlelight uh, in the 1880s. Uh, and Edison was trying to unlock the potential of electricity through direct current. And they convinced Edison to recruit Tesla to come to New York. So he emigrated to the United States, became a U.S. citizen, and began working for Thomas Edison, who he did idolize. Uh, he, was, he was more senior than Tesla, great inventor. Uh, but Tesla begged Edison, forget direct current. Uh, at the time, direct current could only travel for a mile or two. It was a weaker uh, power supply uh, once it got to the end user. And it promised to be a plaything for the rich. You know, he was funded by J.P. Morgan, Thomas Edison, uh, and they were putting a coal-fired power plant in J.P. Morgan's neighborhood, and there'd be a mile or two of a, of a circuit. But you need a power plant every mile or two. That's not sustainable. And what came out was, a, you know, a low-powered electric uh, light, you know, for, for a light bulb. Tesla knew with what his, what he unlocked in his head, that alternating current can go for hundreds of miles and would be much more powerful. And it would power his AC induction motors that, again, were in his head. Uh, it, not because it was in his head, but Edison was too heavily invested with direct current to make that switch. And um, so he, he couldn't work with Tesla on AC. And there was a little bit of a falling out over potentially a $50,000 promised payment. Tesla was working on special projects and direct current for, for Edison. And uh, Edison says he had an offhand remark at lunch. I'll give you $50,000, which is $10 million in today's money. So Edison felt it was an offhand joke. Tesla took it seriously. Either way, Tesla decides to quit. And he ends up going off on his own to do alternating current. He gets back by Westinghouse. And that's where it began. You know, Tesla versus Edison, AC versus DC, 
Westinghouse versus JP Morgan, who was funding Edison at the time. Um, now, I, I, I highlight this story, one, because it changed our lives. Alternate, if we didn't get alternating current at the dawn of the 20th century, it would have taken us 50 years to get you know further for everybody to get electricity. We'd be in the 1940s, 1950s. And so if you talk to the tech innovators of today, like a Bill Gates, when he was asked, what's the most important innovation of the 20th century? It's like the electric grid. We're not, we're not you know, coding on computers if we don't have electric, we don't have computers. Uh, but how did that happen? Westinghouse had such a generous contract with Tesla. It was overly generous to Tesla. They didn't know what they were contracting for at the time. They were gonna pay him four and a half dollars per horsepower produced uh, in, in terms of energy. It made him a, the richest, one of the richest men in the world on paper. Um, but Westinghouse was having a hard time raising capital to compete with Edison and JP Morgan. Tesla really didn't care much about money. He, he liked having it, he liked spending it, but what was his driving force was he knew he was a unique inventor. He wanted to innovate and he wanted to get his inventions out there to society. So he knew that if Westinghouse had a competitive advantage and could raise that capital, that would happen. So he ripped up his royalty contract. And I think that's a, such a huge self-sacrifice. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing uh, Peter Goldsmith from ListNet and, and Long Island Angels. We talk all the time about commercialization. We try to mentor startup companies. Uh, I wish Tesla had mentors around him. He would have been able to do a whole lot more if he had that commercialization edge. But he was an innovator, and he felt that the, the titans of industry would always provide him with capital so that he continued to innovate. Uh, but the rest is history. Westinghouse ends up winning that battle. Alternating current was a better technology at that time for, for the purposes that they needed it for. And city by city, as they each city had an RFP on how to power their city, alternating current started winning out, and it became the standard. Uh, obviously, we have direct current today. If you look at the Tesla Motors car, yes, you have an AC induction motor, but eventually the energy supply becomes direct current. So both were important, but at this time, this was a huge step forward for humanity. And you know, I'm, I'm going to end with this: is that's what was important to Tesla, innovation for the improvement of humanity. And that's how he saw you know, his mission. Tesla was one of the original uh, promote, proponents of alter alternative energy and renewable energy. Uh, even from the time he was eight years old, he, his goal was to unlock the power of places like Niagara Falls, uh, which he did after, after Westinghouse began commercializing the alternating current units. Tesla and Westinghouse won this major RFP to unlock the power of Niagara Falls and build a hydropower plant. And so if you go to Niagara Falls today, you will see a Tesla statue. Uh, there is actually an operating generator still uh, at the Adams power plant that can be turned on uh, for power supply. It's not used every day. Uh, a lot of the equipment they built those days, it, it, it could still work today. Uh, but Tesla was all about using the Earth's forces for powering our lives. After they win this AC-DC battle, Nikola Tesla becomes one of the preeminent inventors. And he is the man about town right here in New York, in New York City. He ends up living at the Waldorf Astoria, uh, hobnobbing with the likes of Mark Twain or Sarah Barnhart, one of the you know, famous actresses of the time. Uh, Jacob Astor is a very good friend of his. They own the Waldorf Astoria. He's one of the richest men uh, in the world at the time. He becomes friendly with J.P. Morgan. Uh, and Stanford White, the famed architect, was one of Tesla's best friends. And, and, the, and Stanford White and the White family, you'll still see their legacy here on Long Island. Their old homestead is still at St. James. It's called Boxwood. And it's how Tesla got pulled here to Long Island from New York City. Uh, J.P. Morgan wanted to see wireless transmission of radio to Europe. Radio was just you know, being broadcast in, in, in small concentric circles at the time. And they really wanted to see international messaging. And so he funded Tesla out in what is now Shoreham. It was called Wardenclyffe at the time. So if anybody's asking, why is it called the Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe? It's a tip of the hat to that history. And um, it, Wardenclyffe was the name of the lab. Stanford White designs the historic lab building that we ended up saving and that we're looking to open to the public. 
he didn't do a lot of commercial properties. Stanford White did the Washington Square Arch in New York City. Uh, he did the um, original Madison Square Garden, many of the Gold Coast mansions that you've seen, both in Rhode Island and here on Long Island. Uh, McKeaton uh, White were, was a very uh, prominent architectural firm. He designed uh, the lab building and the tower with Tesla. The tower went 187 feet in the air uh, and went 200 feet into the ground. His goal was two-way voice communications with multiple channels. So what he basically invented was ham radio, and that's what he was working on. Now, Marconi, Guglielmo Marconi, was working here on Long Island as well in Babylon, trying to do the same thing, a, a transatlantic communication using radio. But he was looking to use Morse code. And he actually ended up using some of Tesla's technologies, originally with Tesla's blessing, because Tesla did not see this as competition, Morse code versus two-way voice. There's quotes of Tesla in 1904, basically predicting the cell phone. He said, you don't understand what I'm working on. I'm not doing Morse code. What I'm working on decades from now, uh, you're going to be able to do, call, carry a device in your vest pocket, and a businessman in New York will be able to call somebody anywhere in the world wirelessly. Again, 1904. So what did people say? That guy's crazy. Uh, but he knew where this would go. He knew the, the basic concepts. He knew it wouldn't happen in his lifetime, but he wanted to create those foundational building blocks. Now, what Tesla did not understand, and Peter will you know, sympathize with this, is the importance of milestones and commercialization. So as he's working on two-way voice, Marconi, using 17 of his patents, does the simple Morse code transmission to Europe. And J.P. Morgan calls Tesla on the carpet and said, how'd this guy beat you? And Tesla's like, he didn't beat me. He's, first of all, he's using our technology. You know, he owes us royalties. Uh, but secondly, he's doing Morse code and doing two-way voice. It's so much more important. And J.P. Morgan's like, I didn't need that. I just wanted to know the New York Stock Exchange ticker tape when I'm in London. Uh, so Morgan stops funding the project just as an, a uh, recession hits and, and there's massive inflation, which might sound somewhat familiar. Um, and, and Tesla gets squeezed financially without a financial backer, costs going up, and he starts pouring his own money in, but he doesn't have enough. And uh, that's, that's the tragedy of Wardenclyffe. The other thing that Tesla tells Morgan, which may have made Morgan skittish, he's like, aside from two-way voice, I think I'm going to be able to do wireless transmission of electricity. Now, Morgan uh, either saw that as too risky. I've seen some reports that Morgan tried to help Tesla raise capital. He just didn't want to put his own in, even though the amount of money Tesla needed was like what Morgan spent on artwork in about three months. But, uh, or secondly, Morgan saw it as a threat. And there, there are uh, some of the industrialists in New York at the time tried to advise Morgan, like, you're really taking a gamble with Tesla. You know, what if wireless transmission works? You have rubber mines that are selling into the distribution system he already created. You have copper mines. What are going to happen to those? So either way, Tesla didn't get that capital. He runs out of capital, and he spends a good two to three decades trying to raise the money he needed from his other inventions to resurrect Wardenclyffe. Well, he loses control of the property, and it ends up getting sold in 1917. Jacob Astor is on the Titanic. He's one of Tesla's backers. He's a very good friend. When the Titanic goes down, Jacob Astor is one of the more prominent folks that, that died on the Titanic. Uh, many think that he would have helped fund Wardenclyffe with Tesla. Also, what happened on the Titanic is Marconi's system, the SOS, came out from Morse code from Marconi's system. So that helped his company just blow up, and Tesla's dreams of getting more funding from somebody like Jacob Astor evaporated. The other thing that happened is Jacob Astor's brother was not friends with Tesla, and he cared less about the inventor. And so he called some of the debts that he accumulated at the uh, Waldorf Astoria, and they took control of the property. They sold it in 1917. They uh, dynamited the tower, July 4th, 1917. That was the fireworks show in Shoreham. And uh, it became a film processing site. Now, uh, they, they made photo emulsions for film processing, a company called Peerless. It became a rel relatively large employer on the east end of Long Island, a few hundred employees around the clock, 24 hours a day. And they operated, uh, you know, they, it became Bear 
uh, Bayer Corp bought them, and then eventually it was Agfa, which is a subsidiary of Bayer. Uh, in 1987, they stopped operations in all of their New York facilities, and they concentrated their efforts into New Jersey. And the New York State DEC uh, mandated a decades-long cleanup because when you're doing photo emulsions, which is a very dirty process in the 30s and 40s, you're not capturing the chemicals. They had a 200-foot pit at the base of where that tower was, and that's where the chemicals went. So it became a brownfield. And that has complicated the, uh, the, cle you know, the cleanup process, but also our process of opening the center as a, a museum and science center. I am happy to say a week ago, we got our seminal permits out of the New York State TEC. It took a really long time because this is the first time a museum is being built on a brownfield in New York State. But with those permits, we now are able to file locally at our town and, and county level, and we should be able to start construction in the next few months. Uh, moving to the timeline, back in the early 90s, uh, a group of science teachers and researchers at Brookhaven National Lab, which is just two miles from the facility, uh, knew, many people didn't know what the site was, they didn't know the historical significance, but the scientists did. And they, they set out on a mission to try to preserve the property and, and, and then open it as a science center. Uh, they reached out to me in 07 because the, the cleanup was done and it was going up for sale. And then they were frantic. They thought they were running out of time and they didn't have the capital to purchase the property. I was able to secure uh, 850,000 in the 2009 New York State budget. Uh, but the thing is that funding needed a match. And uh, that's actually where this gets interesting. So in order to match the funding we were able to get from New York State and purchase the property, the board, and, and it was called Friends of Science at the time, teamed up with an innovator named Matt Inman from oatmeal.com and they launched a crowdfund. Now this is the beginning of the crowdfunding movement. They set a world record. They raised $1.4 million in six weeks from 108 countries and 33,000 donors. That level of a grassroots campaign was unmatched until the 2019 Mr. Beast campaign, the 20 Million Trees campaign. You, you all in the back have heard of that? Now, Mr. Beast, that was a longer campaign, but if anybody's going to beat Tesla, he would have been happy that it was for a cause of, of, uh, of planting 20 million trees and, and helping clean up the environment. Um, but the, the crowdfund is really what saved it. And, um, you know, in 2018, we got on the National Historic Register, and we were off to the races to actually start the planning of the Tesla Science Center. Our mission is to launch a global science center here on Long Island. Uh, and what that means, what do you mean by global, is we have done studies of who is going to come visit. We used a, a, an organization called AECOM, an international engineering firm. They have a department that specifically forecasts visitorship for emerging uh, cultural institutions. And they're always within 10% margin of error up or down, which uh, in some reports, 10% margin of error is a problem. Forecasting visitorship, it's pretty amazing to be within that margin of error. They estimate that we'll have 180,000 visitors a year and almost 60,000 of them are from outside the New York metro area. It's national and international. That it's a draw to Long Island, um, uh, the, the interest for the, for the site. So that's what we mean by Global Science Center. But even more important than that is that when we look at our programming, as much as what we want to do on site, and I'll show you a picture of the site in a second, half of what we do is going to be virtual. And there's three reasons for that. Tesla was a global figure. Number two. We owe the 33,000 donors from 108 countries the ability to enjoy our content before they actually have the opportunity to come here to New York. And third, you know, in that crowd that was well dispersed, it was a huge cross section of the tech innovation community globally. You now, everybody from Elon Musk to Vince Cerf, one of the fathers of the internet, to Larry Page from Google, um, to Dusan Stajanovich, who you'll see in a little bit in one of my slides. Uh, one of the uh, major venture capitalists in Europe, they were in that crowd. And, um, you know, the advice that we've gotten from all of these innovators is they have funded science centers before. And in the 90s, when science centers were raging, but their advice is don't build a Taj Mahal, build something that 
can, people can access virtually and be a leader in that space. And so that's a big important part of our goal as well. So that's the third reason we're doing a lot virtually. Our goal is not only STEM education, but invention education for K through 12 students and then exhibition that inspires not only students, but folks from all walks of life uh, to inspire them about the importance of innovation in our lives. When it comes to virtual programming during COVID, we're not open yet, mind you. We have 175,000 followers worldwide. It gives us the second largest following of any science center in the world and we're not open yet. So when we launched our virtual programming, the 42 programs that we did throughout COVID, we had uh, 26 countries and 37 states participate in that STEM programming. And it was just pilot programming. It was just on Zoom. A lot of that programming, I got a lot of advice from somebody else in the room, Stan Silverman in the back, the ed tech guru of New York State who's here at NYIT. Uh, but we were just testing out uh, the waters on, on some of that STEM programming. But our goal is to, to create more meaningful programming as we open. So what are we gonna do on site? Obviously, it's the Tesla Science Center. The world saved Nikola Tesla's laboratory, and they're expecting to see his story. Um, and that's going to be a big component of what we do. But we're not just going to focus on the past. Uh, quite honestly, Tesla was a futurist, a guy that protects, you know, predicts the cell phone in 1904. If he walked on site and we were talking about what was happening 120 years ago, and that's it, he'd be a little disappointed. Uh, and quite honestly, after all of you come visit us once or twice, you're not gonna come back because you've already seen everything you could about Nikola Tesla. So we are going to tell his story as accurately as possible and give that historical experience. But on other parts of the site, uh, our goal is to celebrate his ethos, which you know, going back to the beginning of our presentation, innovation for the improvement of humanity. Who is doing that today? And you look at those innovators and yes, Elon Musk is one of our biggest benefactors. I, I swear that's not why he's on this slide. But if you think about what he's doing, you know, he's not driven by money anymore. He's looking to do some big strides to move humanity forward. And there are others that we've met. Vint Cerf, the father of the internet, he's on our board of advisors now. When he created the IP protocols that we all use today and made them open source so that it would proliferate, he wasn't thinking about money. He was thinking about changing humanity. Or Marty Cooper, the, the true inventor of the cell phone out of Motorola, um, again, it was, he risked his career challenging one of his biggest customers, AT&T, who did not believe in the cell phone. And he got Motorola to do a moonshot in 1973 to prove in six months that they could build the cell phone. Major risk, but he knew that if they pulled it off, it would move humanity forward. So we want to celebrate that X factor, that creative of what does it take to make game-changing innovation and then the other important part that Tesla sometimes missed, the importance of commercializing it. So bringing in our leaders here in Long Island and, and in other parts of the, the country on helping the Teslas of today in learning how to commercialize their products. And then finally, inspiring the Teslas of tomorrow. When you ask somebody, a, a six-year-old child or a five-year-old child in kindergarten, what are you going to do when you grow up? 95% of them, this is, these are true statistics, 95% of them in that conversation will talk about inventing something. By the time they hit seventh grade, it falls to like 8% because they don't understand the process and they don't see themselves as inventors anymore. But if we're able to introduce them to these concepts, more and more children will see themselves as creators. And here in the United States, we need more creation. We need to continue to have that edge. So here's the site. It's a 16 acre property in Shoreham. Uh, this is the lab building. For the, you, know, you can see my, uh, my, my mouse. This is the historic lab building. We consider that the most important thing on the 16 acre property. And the tower base is still there. So there's, if you come to the site, there's a very large octagon that we, we, we call it the grassy knoll. I don't know if we should probably change that type of terminology. I think it's, that terminology is ruined forever. But uh, we do a lot of events in this area, which is part of the historic area. The other buildings on site that are not pictured here, we're about to start demolition in the next month to free up the lab building, which is hidden by some of these, these buildings. And this is the historical spot. This building down here is the first building that we're looking to get permits for this year. 
Now that we have the DEC permits, that should happen within the next few months, and we start construction. And then we go into the lab building as our site plan is approved next year. We're still raising capital for the lab building. So this is a $20 million project. We raised $12 million so far from the beginning of the organization, the crowd fund, buying the property. Uh, the next $6 million finishes the lab building. And we just got a very important grant last week. It was awarded by, it's called the uh, Saving America's Treasures from the National Park Service. It's a very difficult grant to get. And once it was announced you know, earlier this week, we started getting calls from other granting agencies because they realized once you pass this litmus test at the National Park Service, you're ready for other foundations. So we're very confident that over the next year, we'll be able to close that $6 million and have enough on hand to finish the lab building as well. So this is the first building that we're going to be working on. I know you're looking at the, the, the condition of this house and you're asking, why don't we just knock it down? Again, the technicality is it's easier to get permits and rehabilitate this building and have something open to the public as quickly as possible. And that's our goal. So the finished uh, property will be slightly bigger than, than the house that's on site. It will house an exhibit that's already been designed, a classroom, an office space. And every day we have people at the front gates, not only here from Long Island, but anywhere in the world. And we have to turn them away or we have to make a special appointment to show them the outside of our property. This is a game changer milestone for us because we'll be able to let people inside the gates and into uh, our exhibit and, and welcome them. And then we go into the lab building and we restore it to Nikola Tesla's time as best as we can. And then we start filling it with exhibition. Part of that lab building, you're gonna walk back into time and you're gonna be in Tesla's lab. The rest of the lab building will be a whole lot more immersive. And then on the other buildings on site that we are going to keep, we'll have future looking exhibition with innovators of today. And so this is one of those buildings that we're keeping. This building that you saw also on the site plan, that is just a placeholder to show folks we have more than enough room on property to grow over the next 20 or 30 years, but we're not contemplating building a science center that large right now. We're staying within this footprint that we currently have and rehabilitating it. I wanna to talk to you about some of the folks that we've been able to attract to the project. So from pop culture, everybody from Novak Djokovic to Adam Conover from Adam Ruins Everything, uh, the cast and crew from the Tesla film, Ethan Hawke and Kyle, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Kyle McLaughlin uh, have been, were amazing as that movie came out and helping us promote the center. Tesla, the band, Matt Inman was the internet innovator that helped us with the crowdfund. And Joe Sikorsky is an amazing filmmaker here on Long Island that has uh, created a number of films around Nikola Tesla. And then advisors, I mentioned Vince Sir, one of the fathers of the internet. Uh, you might recognize some of the folks on this page, like Eugene Sion, a, a, a preeminent uh, entrepreneur here on Long Island. Uh, Greg Olson, a venture capitalist out of Princeton, who is one of the first entrepreneurs in space, bought his way onto the Russian uh, Soyuz rocket to get to the uh, International Space Station and do some of his research. Um, Dusan Stajanovic is the uh, VC out of Europe that helped push the envelope of what we should be looking to do from a future-looking perspective. And you will recognize some of the folks on this slide. So when we talk about doing STEM education, we're looking for advisors that can help us really move the dial. We're not just looking to do additional STEM education. We think there's a, you know, there's a lot of great content out there. We're looking to do some unique things in invention education. So everybody from Stan Silverman, who's right here in the back, uh, to Dr. John Cohen, who's the head of the AI lab at MIT and the IBM fellow there, but if you Google him, he's the mad scientist trying to turn kids onto STEM education. To Chris Lawrence on the bottom, I, I can't go through everybody because I don't want to take up all the time, but Chris Lawrence was the head of STEM education at the New York Hall of Science when it was the, uh, I think it was called the Queens Hall of Science at the time in the 90s, when again, science centers were just coming online, STEM education was gaining in prominence. He was considered one of those major innovators. He has left and gone into the tech sector where his passion project. He wants to take all of his knowledge and help us do something very unique. Uh, this is our board. Um, and I want to thank one of my board members who I think is on the video, uh, Mitch Maiman, uh, who helped arrange uh, the talk here today. Uh, he has his affiliation here at NYIT. But some of these board members are some of the original founding board members that had that vision to save the property. And then they spent years 
uh, training themselves how to become a more professional board and then start accepting some of the leaders in the industry like Mitch Maimon or Ed Fred, who is the former CEO of CPI Aeronautics and the former chair of the Cradle of Aviation Board, Judy Mara, who is now at Applied DNA Sciences, uh, originally out of Symbol Technologies, and uh, Judy helped launch in the 1990s, the Long Island STEM movement. Um, Peter Klein just recently joined our board from the Claire Friedlander Foundation. And two new to have photos, uh, Michelle Dean and Ellen Deutsch uh, just joined the board too. Um, again, uh, leaders in the, in the Long Island business community. Our goal has been to expand our board to accept leaders like this that can help us get to the next level. And then we'll, through concentric circles, start allowing national and international board members on. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all the staff. I talked about how this was a $20 million campaign. It's a slightly old slide. We raised a little under $12 million. Uh, and the next $6 million will help us finish the lab building. So, Nikola Tesla, let the future tell the truth and evaluate each one according to his work and accomplishments. The present is theirs. The future for which I have really worked is mine. And I think that's such an important slide, and I'm, I'm going to end with that, uh, that, that comment. He realized he was much maligned in his day. People didn't understand everything that he was working on. He's like, you'll see. In the next few decades, you'll come back and realize that what I've been working on now is impacting your lives. So that's our presentation. I'll take questions. Any questions? Anybody? Yes. I'm still curious. Um, <clears throat> Has there ever been any relationship with Dean Kamen? You know, and people bring up Dean Kamen often. Uh, we have reached out to his um, office to get him more involved. He's shown interest, but we haven't consummated a relationship yet. Um, we are approached by robotics clubs very often here on Long Island, and we want to do something meaningful in that space. Uh, again, you know, it doesn't matter what industry you talk about. I'm going to say Tesla was involved in some way, but... He did do early forms of robotics and, 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 and saw where that movement would go. So it's a natural extension of what we'd like to do on site. Mark, is everything going to be in roughly the plan? Like what kind of data are you looking at for an initial so, launch and classroom visits and right? You know? Next year. Uh, so the visitor center, again, it's going to be small. We're not going to have you know five classes at one time, but we'll be able to accept school children on site and visitors on site. Our goal is you know, fall of 2023. Um, assuming that these permits fall into place this fall, we will start construction in the winter on the house. And our goal will be by the summer of 2023 to actually do a ribbon cutting. Uh, I had just asked what the estimated date was for opening if everything goes well. So th that would be the visitor center, uh, you know, where we're, we'll be welcoming the public by fall of 2023. We anticipate that the site plan, and not to get too technical, the visitor center, that house is on a separate property. That's one of the reasons we're starting there. It's considered a separate property in the town of Brookhaven, so we can get permits faster. The site plan process will probably take another year. So by the summer of next year, as we're opening the visitor center, we should have our permits in place and funding in place for the lab building. And that's a good year and a half after that. So beginning of 2025 is probably when we're launching the lab building. Or the, or the museum inside the lab building. The historical artifacts that you're putting in Tesla in the museum, do you have them or are you looking for them? We, we have some. So people... Uh, just earlier today, I did an uh, interview with Newsday, and that was one of the questions. They were walking around the site, and what do you have inside? Is there any of his you know, materials left? And you know, when Tesla lost control of the property, he had debtors. And so whatever was worth anything, the debtors collected and sold. Whatever was more sentimental, people broke in and took. So by the time Peerless was there, everything was taken out. Um, Tesla had a number of inventions and personal effects that he carried with him from hotel to hotel. Uh, when he ended up passing away in 1943, he was at the New Yorker Hotel. And I don't know if you know the story, but the FBI was in the room within about three hours and collecting his effects, and they held on to it for about 15 years because Tesla was talking about his invention of a death ray. And there was a concern that whatever his work was, was going to get into the wrong hands. So 
those personal effects after the uh, US government uh, was done pouring through it was given to one of his relatives and it was shipped to Serbia. So for us, we're starting from square one. We get donations from Tesla enthusiasts that have something of value, uh, might not be something Tesla personally owned, like a dynamo that was at the building, but his dynamos that he built for Westinghouse, the industry, industry use. So General Mills, for example, sent us a dynamo or, or, or one of the engines that used to power their assembly lines. It still works. It's, it's, it's in storage now. So we're going to piece together. We have photographs of his lab. We're going to try to recreate that lab as best we can. Would you mind repeating what that question was? Oh, I forgot that rule. <laughs> <laughs> so I was asked what of the, um, you know, Tesla's materials and inventions uh, do we have on hand? And, and the answer is we're going to have to recreate mm -hmm. most of it. I'll repeat it. I'm going to start to do now. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so great inspiration talk. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, what advice would you give us for the future scientists in this room? Uh, I know that you have talked through your inspirational stories from failure to successes of the technology that you took to two examples right now. Um, you know, so using a cellular phone or wireless technology years ago. Um, so first, one question that, you know, what is your advice would you give to future top scientists or all the engineers that are in the room? My second uh, portion of the question is, you mentioned about that if the sixth grader, if you ask them the question, what do they want to do in the future? You know, do they want to invent something? But later on, that um, motivation becomes less because they don't have the resources or probably they're not exposed to enough science centers or technology. So, you know, you are talking about we're talking about STEM programming, right? But STEM program should start that early in their um, school life, or you know, or how do you think that you know that's going to be a, a successful project? Sure. So uh, part one, uh, I'm going to repeat as as best I can uh, for the scientists or the emerging scientists here in the room. What advice do I have? Uh, and if you're looking to commercialize potentially. Uh, and do applied sciences that turn into products. Listen to Peter Goldsmith, listen to Mike Nizich at the ETIC system uh, on, uh, on that commercialization process. I'm gonna say that Tesla, as I've studied his biography, uh, it pained me because I'm a commercial, I, I'm a serial entrepreneur and he had so much talent and he would invent things and put it on the shelf. Like the Tesla valve, he's like, nobody can use this today. It's a one-way flow valve with no moving parts based on a shock's internal system. But he knew it would be of use. Today, the gas industry is using it. The biomedical device industry is using it. He just knew it would be useful to humanity. Um, but when it came to wireless technology, he was trying to do the two-way voice when his investors just wanted Morse code and to commercialize something there. Uh, when the US Navy approached Tesla to just do his wireless system with voice for some of the ships, for short distances, would have brought money in. He refused. He was trying to do the moonshot always. And it's important to hit those milestones and, and commercialization points. And, you know, Mike sees it, Peter sees it, I see it when we work with, you know, I'm a CEO to a, the, the yin and the yang of a CTO uh, that, you know, the creative will continue to reiterate. And it's important to have that partnership with the commercialization end to figure out what the market needs and, and when they need it. And, 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 and do it methodically. Now, the, the second part of the question was uh, for the young children and trying to expose them to STEM, uh, what, what are the appropriate ages? And you can create STEM content that's appropriate for each grade level. So it might be pretty rudimentary when we're dealing with a first grader and a second grader, but we can still build in some of those concepts and just get them excited uh, about some of the, you know, th th those applied physics. And then by the time we have them going into seventh and eighth grade, they could be building small ham radios. And by the time they're going into college, they might be thinking, I know how to build the next iPhone. Thank you. So I have no idea if the curriculum is kind of set up yet or anything. I, I can easily see um, the 
traditional museum of Catholic history, right? The world is kind of hands on experiments all that. I just wanted to say, I, I, I think this would be fascinating as an entrepreneurial track to right? like the mistakes he made, the yeah. investments, the investors, the competition, the patents, the intellectual property. If you're thinking about it already, wonderful. I just think that this could be, I could easily see going to a seminar up there and not learning so much about Tesla as much as the mistakes Tesla made and that yeah. how do I how do I not make those mistakes? I just we, wanted to put it out there. I, I think you're you're right on point of our thinking, which helps you know validate uh, that that we're not off the mark in that, yes, it, we'd like to have that kind of program on site. We might talk about Tesla for like three minutes for the the one hour and saying, you know, you're, you're on site, Tesla's last lab. This is some of the mistakes he might've made from a commercialization standpoint. How do we avoid that? Um, and I mentioned Dusan Stajanovich, how I got pulled back into this project was after I was out of office and I was working with Peter and, 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 and you uh, eventually, you know, I was hyper-focused on incubators and early stage finance and startups. And, um, then you had these venture capitalists from Europe talking about doing an incubator on site. So the board wanted me to get involved and vet it. And where my mind has gone through the incubator association and talking to some of our members is we don't want an incubator on site. We're not, we're not, you know, we're not looking to house companies for that long. And I thought about maybe an accelerator and a, a six week program or, and where, where it's going right now is we want to work with the incubation movement and maybe utilize, we have this very big brand and, you know, part of it is Tesla Motors, but th th there's this, this big brand and following globally, we'd like to use that reach to do business plan competitions and corporate innovation challenges. Yeah. Uh, and then bring in the education center to begin with. Now you also have this other track that, you know, is, is, is you know, business focus. I, I just, I just think it'd be a cool place to go for a seminar and learn. Awesome. Yeah. Really neat. Really neat. Thank you. We do have a question via Zoom. Um, we have a student asking if you have any um, machine learning or artificial intelligence Tesla related research that your team's doing. So definitely not yet. We only have so much bandwidth and really the, the majority of our bandwidth is, is some strategic planning on where our programming will go. Some pilot programming uh, to test out uh, more from the K through 12 perspective. But when it comes to machine learning and AI, you know, uh, like you, I saw, you, you saw that one of our mentors and advisors is the head of the AI lab at MIT, Dr. John Cohen. Some of those conversations have morphed into, as we launch, you know, could we have Tesla on our website answering a natural language and avatar when you ask a question as opposed to typing in and doing a search on our website? Can you just talk to Nikola Tesla? And, um, and then trying to pull that off, you know, we're going to have a learning curve and we're going to pull people into that. Uh, but we're going to expose folks to that new technology. Uh, you know, right now we do online galas, and you know, this is not off course, I promise. Um, I had a tech company out of Israel create an avatar of Tesla who gave a speech at our gala. Uh, we were honoring Vin Cerf, one of the fathers of the internet. We had so much packed into that gala that the next day, I'm going to just say the inventor of the internet called me. He's like, that was the best online gala I've ever been to. This is in the middle of COVID, so there was a lot of online galas. He's like, my colleagues at Google would like to know who did it so that, you know, we could have them involved with our gala. And that was, again, uh, for us, it was a big learning curve, but it was my staff that did it. And we definitely didn't have the bandwidth to try to help anybody else with it. So it was a, it was a nice compliment. I think we have time for one more question. So if anyone in person or via Zoom, you want to add? So, uh, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, how do you, you know, explain to an inventor the importance of commercialization that feels it might stymie their creativity? Uh, and, and that might have been one of the impediments for Tesla that he want to be constrained uh, with those small milestones. And there, there's something to that, you know, but there's different levels of invention and, and engineering. So basic research is done at federal labs uh, where it doesn't have to lead to commercialization, but it leads to understanding and it might lead to 
groundbreaking innovation that eventually can be commercialized. Um, but if someone is is looking to invent and get it out to the marketplace, um, they have to you know kind of follow the tried and true methods to make sure that they're they're doing it in a you know a lean startup methodology way. They're not inventing something that there's no market for, and and so on and so forth. Um, I, it, it, it's kind of like an ebb and flow and a yin and a yang in terms of you don't want to stymie the creativity, but you need the, the business side when you're looking to do something in, in the marketplace. You still need the moonshots, though. You still need you know somebody like a Tesla who's not looking to make money, but is looking to move something forward in a big way. Um, and I'm, I see it every day. You know, the folks that come in and out of industry, but end up in academia, uh, or you know, uh, some folks in academia still feel that the kind of grants that they're you know filing for and some of the protocols of their institution are uh, you know might be limiting them. And some of them ask us to create uh, an innovation center on Tesla's campus where they can go and get grants and do things that you know uh, nobody's even thinking of. Um, we don't want to limit in innovators, but at the same time, we don't want them to languish and continue to iterate and, and, and not see the fruits of their labor. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, that's unfortunately all the time that we have. I am now going to segue to the Dean's closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alessi, for the great presentation. Thank you all for participating in this event. Many thanks go to colleagues who made this event happen, Dr. Dr. Robert DeFazio, Assistant Dean Jane Polizzi, and the amazing College of Engineering and Computing Sciences staff, Ms. Jill Rogers and Ms. Sarah Hesesta. Please tune in for the next talk as it will be advertised through the same channels uh, you learned about this talk. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much everyone for attending um, and Hope you have a great day.